the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. If you are here uh, expecting to see Abuna Paul, my apologies. Uh, unfortunately, you guys got stuck with me today, but uh, I'll try to do the best that I can. Um, so I have to admit, last week when I was asked to give Light and Life, I was a little bit nervous. And uh, I was especially nervous because uh, I didn't have a topic. You know, they said, speak about whatever you want. And as a speaker, that's kind of the worst thing sometimes. Somebody says, speak whatever you want. Because, um, you know, I didn't really have anything on my mind. So I was really, really struggling to find a topic. And I was texting people. I was saying, what should I talk about? You know, what's going on? And uh, I was just really, really struggling with the topic. And then we had a friend come over to our house for dinner. And as every conversation seems to end these days, we started talking about the whole gay marriage thing and America and where's America going. And, and I made a statement, something along the lines of that, I feel like America is going down the tubes and there's no hope for the future. Okay? And I started to think about it and I said, is that really true? Is there no hope for us here in America? I feel like things are just going, getting worse and worse and worse. And then I started, you know, checking the news and then I started to think to myself, no, I really do not have hope for the future, okay? Because this doesn't exactly give me any hope. And as I was trying to find a topic, I started browsing around. I started searching some websites. And um, it's funny, I went to an Orthodox website that I usually go to to read articles. And I said, let me just look around and see if anything catches my eye. And I saw a very interesting sermon that was posted. And ironically, it wasn't from an Orthodox speaker, an Orthodox pastor. It was from a non-Orthodox pastor, and it was called St. Paul's Letter to the Americans. And I thought to myself for a second, as far as I can recall, I do not recall St. Paul writing a letter to the Church of America. So I was intrigued by it. So I started reading it. And what happened was it was actually a very famous pastor in America from the 1950s and 60s wrote this imaginary letter. He thought to himself, if St. Paul was to write a letter to the Church of America, what would it sound like? So he came up with this imaginary letter, um, and it's actually a very famous pastor from America, and he, he gave this sermon, or he read this letter to his church in 1956, 1956. And when I read it, I said, wow. <clears throat> so if you'll give me, just bear with me for a few minutes, I'm gonna read parts of the letter to you. I took a few parts out. I took the parts that I thought were most relevant to us. And it may take a few minutes, but I think it's really important. So please bear with me while I read to you. Again, this is an imaginary letter. Think about St. Paul if he were to write to the Church of America. It starts off, I, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to you who are in America, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For many years I have longed to be able to come to see you. I have heard so much of what you and of what you are doing. I have heard of the fascinating and astounding advances that you have made in the scientific realm. I have heard of your dashing subways and flashing airplanes. I have also heard of your skyscraping buildings with their prodigious towers steeping heavenward. I have heard of your great medical advances which have resulted in the curing of many dreaded plagues and diseases and thereby prolonged your lives and made for greater security and physical well-being. You have made tremendous strides in the area of scientific and technological development. But America, as I look at you from afar, I wonder whether your moral and spiritual progress has been commensurate with your scientific progress. It seems to me that your moral progress lags behind your scientific progress. You have allowed the material means by which you live to outdistance the spiritual ends for which you live. You have allowed your mentality to outrun your morality. Through your scientific genius, you have made of the world a neighborhood, but through your moral and spiritual genius, you have failed to make of it a brotherhood. Isn't the world a neighborhood now with all the social media? Aren't we all connected together? But you have failed to make of it a brotherhood. So America, I would urge you to keep your moral advances abreast with your scientific advances. I am impelled to write you concerning the responsibilities laid upon you to live as Christians in the midst of an unchristian world. That is what I had to do. That's St. Paul. This is what every Christian has to do. But I understand that there are many Christians in America who give their ultimate allegiance to man-made systems and customs. They are afraid to be different. Their great concern is to be accepted socially. They live by some, such some principle as everybody is doing it, so it must be all right. For so many of you, morality is merely group consensus. You have unconsciously come to believe that right is discovered by taking a sort of Gallup poll of the majority opinion. But American Christians, I must say to you as I said to the Roman Christians years ago, 
do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or as I said to the Philippian Christians, for our citizenship is in heaven. This means that although you live in the colony of time, your ultimate allegiance is to the empire of eternity. The Christian owes his ultimate allegiance to God, and if any earthly institution conflicts with God's will, it is your Christian duty to take a stand against it. This letter was written in 1956. Isn't it seem like it was just written yesterday? Don't when we sit around a conversation feel like America used to be a Christian country, what's going on? This was 1956, okay? And by the way, if you're curious, that pastor's name was Dr. Martin Luther King, the famous civil rights activist. Right after I read that, I came across another quote. It says, How needful the human being is of service of the Spirit in an age where materialism, atheism, apostasy, and deviant intellectual trends prevail. How needful people are to see Christ in our lives and to smell his sweet fragrance in us. There is upon the church a critical duty at this juncture through which the world is passing today. It is upon her to advocate faith in hearts, to spread virtue, to bring peace and serenity into every weary soul so that tranquility might abound and well-being might be plentiful. This message was said by Pope Corliss VI in 1959, and he's talking about materialism, atheism, apostasy, and deviant intellectual trends. Okay? So 1956 and 1959, and how much these words apply to us today. And then I started to think to myself, wait a second, I realized something. Every Christian generation has its struggles. It doesn't matter when it was. I know a lot of times we say that we live in an evil generation, and I think we do live in an evil generation, but every generation of Christians had to deal with something. I know that recently the persecution of Christians has been on our minds. I know for many of us, for me, in my entire life, I can't remember anything like this except for a couple years ago. Is anybody else? I don't remember anything like this, okay? And ISIS has made us realize things. This, this picture, unfortunately, has become way too familiar, right? But is this any different than when Christians were being thrown to the lions under the Roman Empire? Is this any different than the book of Acts? Is it any different than the history of the church? Is it any different than in the 20th century where you had the genocide of one and a half million Armenian Christians? No. Every generation has to witness to Christ in its own way. And every generation has its own struggles. You heard the words from two very well-respected people from the 50s, okay? But in America, we may not have direct physical persecution, okay? But the persecution of Christians is coming in a very different way, okay? We live in a society where people are celebrating the destruction of the family unit. People are proud of that. We live in a world where someone changes their sexual identity and becomes a hero, okay? Someone's given awards and made a hero. We live in a world where some people are more upset over the killing of one lion versus the killing of thousands and thousands of people every single day. So make no mistake about it, okay? Our witness has to be different, okay? We live in a different world. We live in a different society, and our witness won't be the same as others. But here's the thing that, that makes me worried, is that I feel like the spirit of the world has crept into the, into the church, okay? It's become our spirit as Christians, unfortunately. And as with every problem, there's a root cause to everything, right? There's always a root cause. And I tried to think about the root cause, and I feel like it's something that is in the lifeblood of America. You know what that root cause is? It's something called freedom, believe it or not. This country takes pride on being a free country, right? We are the land of the free and the home of the brave. And everything in America is about freedom. If it feels right, it must be right. I've had these feelings all my life, so they can't be wrong. And the entire world is chasing its desires, okay? There is no freedom, okay? That's actually not called freedom. You know what that's called? It's called slavery because we have zero control over ourselves. When the prodigal son wanted to be free, when he wanted to be free from his father's house, what happened to him? He ended up lower than the pigs. He became a slave to the pigs. Even the pigs wouldn't feed him, right? So with freedom, there's actually a cost associated with it, 
okay? Freedom comes with a price. Freedom comes with accountability and responsibility. When God created Adam and Eve in the garden, he created them to live freely, and he created them with free will, right? But he laid before them a law, a rule, a consequence. He said, you can eat of all the trees in the garden except for this one. If you choose to eat of this tree, there will be a consequence. There will be a consequence, and you shall surely die. And man, according to his own free will, chose to disobey, and there was a consequence to that. And believe me, all of the so-called freedom in the world, okay, has its consequence, and we are all bearing the consequences of it. So in order for us to witness to Christ in this age, there has to be something different, okay? I believe one thing is, is needed. One major thing is needed. And you may look at it, it may sound simple, okay? It sounds simple, but it's actually very hard. And you may say it's a cop-out, but this is what I believe is needed to witness to Christ in this generation, okay? Sorry, I'm going to get to this in a second, okay? One thing is needed, okay, and that thing is called personal repentance, Okay? Personal repentance. I know that word has kind of a Sunday school connotation to it, okay? And I know we've heard it many, many times in sermons, but to be honest, I think we have no idea what repentance means. And if we understand what repentance means, then you will see that our witness will be stronger than anything else we can do in this world. Now let's go back to the beginning again, okay? In the beginning, God created man in his image. Okay? So all of man's thoughts were rational thoughts. Okay? They had been illuminated by the grace of God. But when man sinned and chose to separate himself from God, automatically man's personality was immediately destroyed and his simplicity became complexity. Okay? And his rational behavior became irrational behavior. And that irrational behavior is something what the fathers called the passions. Okay? And that's a lot what we're going to talk about today, is the passions. We want to understand what the passions are and how to fight against them. <clears throat> Irrational thoughts and deeds are called passions. Why? Because they don't operate in accordance with rational laws and needs. They operate in accordance with unnatural urges and desires, which end up leading to sin and the evil that we find in the world. The passions basically are an expression of our self-centeredness and our own ego. They're basically looking for a way to satisfy our spiritual desire with carnal means, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about today. I mean, think about it. As soon as man fell, look what happened with Cain and Abel. Didn't take very long, did it? Right? For evil to creep into the world and for man's urges to become irrational, okay? You were jealous of your brother, so you killed him. These are the passions. And that's why, that's why St. Paul reminds us that those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, okay? <clears throat> now, the fathers of the church kind of put the passions of the soul, they kind of put them in three big categories, okay? Love of pleasure, love of money, and love of glory. And under these three big headings, we can find kind of the roots of many, many sins. So love of pleasure, for example. Under that, we find sexual desire, Gluttony, laziness, and slothfulness, okay? This by, by no means is like a, a comprehensive list, okay? But these are the major things, all right? So let's take a look at the passions here. Sexual desire, okay? Sexual desire was put in us for a natural purpose, right? It was given, uh, given to us to be used within the context of one man and one woman inside of marriage for a healthy way, both for procreation and for pleasure, Right? But when the, the, the rational use becomes irrational and distorted, what happens then? We go into sexual immorality. We find lust. We find all the things creeping in, and that's why the world is going crazy, right? Because now what was natural is becoming unnatural, irrational, okay? Same thing with all of these. What is gluttony? It's an abnormal use of food, right? It's an unnatural connection with food. Food, we all love food. I'm the first one here, okay? I love to eat like anybody else. I love junk food. I love everything that everybody else loves, right? But this is an unnatural use. Food was given to us to sustain us, 
to keep our bodies going, but not to be uh, used for like uh, gluttony and, and so many things. And actually, you know, the church fathers say, you know the number one um, uh, thing leading to sexual desire in this world? It's actually gluttony. Why? Because you are feeding your flesh more and more and more, and the lion, the flesh that is within you, the passions, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? So you can see here how all these things here, all these things called the passions, can grow, and they were put inside of us for a reason, but for a natural purpose, not an unnatural purpose like they've become these days. Okay? St. Justin the Martyr says, to yield and give way to our passions is the lowest slavery, even as to rule over them is the only liberty. Let me ask you a question. Who doesn't struggle with any one of these things here? Right? Who doesn't struggle with any one of them? We have to ask ourselves a very simple question. Okay? If I want to identify the passions within me and things that are becoming unnatural within me, what is it that pushes my buttons? What are the things that annoy me? What are the things that make me angry? What are the things that motivate me? This is how I start to assess myself and see what it is uh, that's, that's pushing my buttons, that's driving me, and so on and so forth. I'll give you an example. Preparing for this talk today, I was actually kind of stressed out, okay? And if I evaluate the stress that I called myself, caused myself this week, you know what I, 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 I bring it back to? Very simple. Uh, right here. My own pride. You know why? Because I don't want anybody to say, wow, that talk today in Light and Life was horrible, Okay? Or I want people to say, wow, that talk was amazing. I mean, George changed my life, and I repented, and I'm like, you know, on cloud nine, right? At the end of the day, whatever stress I cause myself in preparing, if I'm honest with myself, is related to what? My own ego, right? And we have to ask ourselves, what's the stress in your life related to? Is it your work? Maybe it's related to a, uh, a, a performance evaluation coming up, right? Maybe it's that I'm so into my job, I want to be the best. Maybe it's covetousness. Maybe I want to get a big raise. Whatever it is that's pushing our buttons, we have to look at it and say, <clears throat> you know what, this is a sin. Being stressed out this week over preparing a talk, this is actually a sin that I need to repent for, okay? Because it's something inside of me that is causing problems and affects me in many different ways. Whether it's your kids, your spouse, Whatever it is that pushes your buttons, you got to look at it and say, what's the problem? Is it my ego? Is it my, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit greedy, maybe I'm covetous, my envy, jealousy, so on and so forth. I'm telling you, if we evaluated ourselves honestly every single day, we would find thousands of things that we need to correct, that we need to, um, we need to fix. St. Isaac the Syrian says, it is a greater miracle that a man can see his true self than the raising of the dead. So here's the big million dollar question, right? How can I be free? How can I experience true freedom and not the freedom of what the world says is true freedom, which is actually slavery? You know, the Lord talked a lot about denying yourself. He talked a lot about carrying your cross and he spoke about the narrow gate. Okay, and I know we don't like to hear any of that stuff, but if we water down the gospel, like many churches do, many people do, we will never, ever have victory and true freedom as God wants us to have. The Lord said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. To be honest with you, it takes some warfare, okay? It's going to take some warfare on our part if we want to begin to overcome these struggles. In the Orthodox Church, we don't have something... We have something called synergy, okay? Synergy, which is basically cooperation with God. Yes, I have to struggle and do my part, but God will also do his part, okay? The Lord said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. The Lord knocks, but we have to open the door, right? As St. John Chrysostom says, he says, God never draws anyone to himself by force and violence. He wishes all men to be saved, but forces no one. So we must fight against the passions, okay? We have to fight. And what's our main tool to fight? It's actually something called asceticism. And I know this is not something we like to hear because we think this is the ascetic life, okay? It means I have to be a monk, 
living in the wilderness, living in the desert, and I have to do all these monastic things. But I'm telling you, every single Christian has to live an ascetic life, okay? There has to be some form of asceticism in our lives to understand and to cleanse and to heal the demons that are inside, okay? There has to be a form. And what I'm going to try to do a little bit is to explain the healthy understanding of asceticism because I know as soon as we, we see this or we think about the monastic life, we think about long prayers and long hours of fasting and matanyas and seclusion and all these things. But I want to explain to you why monks go to this level and how every single lay person here has a responsibility to do the exact same thing. Okay? Now, obviously, there are degrees, right? A person who's married with children, who's working, living in the world, has different um, degrees, different, their asceticism may take a different form, but nevertheless, we all have to fight and we all have to struggle. So I know asceticism has a negative connotation, okay? It usually means we always look at the cutting out things, okay? But the word asceticism actually means to exercise, Okay, it's actually a positive work. And most of the times, we only see the negative aspects. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say I have weeds in my garden, okay? And I pull out the weeds, right? I pull them out from the root and everything. What's left? A hole. If I don't fill the hole, what's gonna happen? The weeds are just gonna come back again. So true asceticism is removing the evil, okay, the bad things inside, but replacing them with the good things inside, okay? It's not just a matter of doing all the negative things, okay? Many Eastern religions have ascetics, okay? They don't eat, they don't sleep, they do all these things. But as St. Anthony the Great said, some have afflicted their bodies by asceticism, but they lack discernment, and so they are far from God. Again, there's a cooperation, a synergy, okay? So my ascetic strivings without the spirit of God, without guidance, without a spiritual rule, a spiritual father, a spiritual guide, will bring no benefit. I didn't put these verses on the, the slide, but the Lord said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places, seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. That's exactly like taking the weed out, right? There's a nice hole that's swept and clean, put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay? So without the proper understanding, we may see ourselves in a worse state than we started with. And I see, we see this with many people, right? Many people are offended at the church, right? They tried to come to church. They tried to do the right things, but they were offended by somebody. You know why? A lot of times, because they tried without discernment. Maybe they did think, they tried fasting and they found it miserable because they didn't just maybe change their diet without adding the healthy piece, replacing the old man with the new man. So when we take fasting, for example, right? Many of us despise fasting and we make fun of fasting. But fasting done in the right way has two wings, okay? It has charity or giving and it has prayer. Many of us will want to add the fasting piece without adding the prayer or the, the giving piece, right? This is basically the constitution of our Christianity. Fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, like we always practice during Lent, right? This is the Sermon on the Mount. If you had to sum it up in three things, the Lord said, it would be fasting, prayer, and giving of alms or charity. But many times, we're only looking at the negative aspect without replacing uh, with the positive aspect. So asceticism is a gradual death with Christ, okay? I can't be resurrected with him unless I first die with him. So through the incarnation of Christ, humanity took a special grace. When Christ took the form of man, okay, we all took because we were in him. When you were baptized, you were baptized into him. So when he sanctified humanity, he gave us the grace to overcome and to receive the new nature, okay? When you were baptized, you received the new nature, but what happened, unfortunately, is after our baptism, we didn't keep, okay? It's the responsibility of every parent to preserve the baptism of their children, correct? If you remember the oath that you took on the baptism day of your child for those who are parents and those who will be parents, you have a responsibility to keep, to protect, to tend the garden. 
when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, you know what he told them? He said, just tend it, just keep it. Okay, I've already given you everything. Just keep and maintain. Isn't much easier to maintain a garden than to let your backyard go crazy like I do? I let my yard grow for like a month or two months, and then I find the weirdest things growing in there, and God knows what. But if I was normal, I would just cut my grass on a weekly basis and save myself the headache, okay? But many of us have the spiritual weeds that are growing out of control, and we don't even know what they are. Weeds popping up, and you say, what is this weird thing? I have no idea what it is, okay? So we have to, um, we have to be uh, careful of that. Okay, there's a quote from St. Cyril of Jerusalem that said, it is for God to grant his grace and your task to accept that grace and to guard it, okay? And St. Cyril of Jerusalem is very famous for his catechetical lectures. Um, those who are studying Christianity, St. Cyril has like a very famous series of lectures where he gave advice to those Christians who wanted to become. And he said, it is for God to grant his grace and your task to accept that grace and to guard it. So we always have to be on guard, Okay. So there are some things to keep in mind when we're struggling against the passions, okay? Number one is that we have to be aware, okay? Sometimes they're so subtle, we consider them so natural that they don't even mean anything to us. So let me give you an example that will probably offend most of the people in this room, okay? It's a very simple example, but let's be honest, okay? Our good friend here, Mr. Coffee, okay? And God bless the coffee ministry. The line here was like amazing. We haven't seen a line this long in uh, I don't know how long, okay? We know that everybody loves their morning cup of coffee, right? Who here knows somebody that if they don't have their morning cup of coffee, they can't function? Maybe some of you are those people, okay? So you don't have to raise your hand. But some people, if you don't want to talk to them, they have a headache, they're grumpy, they're miserable without the morning cup of coffee, right? And we laugh and we joke. But this is a serious problem, right? Because who has become your master now? A coffee cup. It determines what time you wake up, probably. It determines your activity level in the morning. It determines how grumpy you are, your mood. And all from a harmless, cute little cup with whipped cream on top, right? A subtle passion that actually has big implications in our life. Okay? Believe me, I'm, the, I'm not much of a coffee drinker, but I found myself becoming a coffee drinker, and I'm trying by all means to avoid coffee so I don't turn into Mr. Grumpy in the morning. Okay? But I'm not saying that because I'm trying to be better than anybody. I have my own struggles, but I want us to be aware of th- this is a passion. Okay? This is something inside of me that needs to be healed, believe it or not. Okay? I remember asking somebody, we were, uh, it was like last Lent, and they had never fasted before, meaning to abstain from food for a time. So I was trying to encourage them, saying, you know, why don't you fast for a time? She said, okay, but I have to have my morning cup of coffee. So I asked a simple question. I said, what liturgy do you go to? She said, I go to the second liturgy. I said, what time is communion? She said, 11.30-ish. And I said, do you drink coffee before you go to communion on Sundays? She said, no. I said, did you survive? She said, yes. I said, whoa, wait a second. So you can go three, four hours from waking up in the morning without a coffee on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, you're going to die if you don't have a cup of coffee. Why? Because we have been trained, okay? You have trained your body that on Sunday mornings, there's no coffee, okay? But we have to take that training, something small like coffee, and apply it to the rest of our lives. Another example, okay? Our good friend, this guy here, okay? This thing, if we think about it, has basically destroyed our lives, okay? I know it's great. I know it comes in handy. But if I can't stop at a stoplight without looking at my phone, if I'm texting and driving, if I can't eat, I see old people now that can't sit in a doctor's office without checking their Facebook, okay? They're like 70, and they're on their Facebook, okay? This has destroyed our attention span, okay? It's, a, it's destroyed mine for sure, okay? I go to read a spiritual book now, and I, first few pages, I'm done. That's it, okay? I need short things. I need 140 characters, and I'm, I'm done. That's it, okay? But this is something that's not healthy for us, okay? No wonder we can't pray for a long time. No wonder we can't sit still and listen to a lecture for a long time. No wonder we can't read the Bible for a long time. No wonder I can't finish a book cover to cover. I haven't finished a book cover to cover in years, okay? And when I trace it back, my attention span is shot. I can't. I can't focus on more than one thing for more than five minutes, okay? So they're subtle, and sometimes they're easy to miss, okay? 
But these small things, okay, are just the elementary level, okay? How can we move to the greater commandments if I can't even overcome a cup of coffee? How can I love my neighbor as myself? How can I love my enemy? How can I give my food to feed the poor? How can I wash the feet of others? How can I lay my, lay my life down for others? How? If I don't first overcome these small things, okay? A lot of times the passions are coming from repeated sins or sins that I haven't repented from, okay? So if there's something deep down in there, it becomes habitual, okay? It's like I don't even notice it anymore. It becomes part of me. And another thing to keep in mind is that the passions need healing, okay? They need healing. Look at it like a restoration, okay? A restoration process. Have you ever seen or ever heard of like these old chapels where they're trying to restore the original artwork? Sometimes the artwork has been, you know, covered over with other paintings or other things, and they will take, you know, hours and days just to work on one small square inch, right? Why? Because they don't want to destroy the original. It needs certain care, okay? You are an original, okay? And we all need to be restored to the original image, but it may take time, and it may take care, and it needs some guidance. It needs a specialist, right? Right? It needs a spiritual guide. It needs a spiritual doctor to help us. But over time, there is a restoration process and a healing process. So we have to be patient. Again, we have no patient these days. No patience, right? We're not patient. Everything is fast. Microwave, uh, anything, any question I have, I can search on my phone, right? If I need to, to find something, I just search on my phone. If I have a question, search on my phone. If I need to get somewhere, I don't call somebody and ask and get directions, look at a map. Hop on the GPS, right? So this has destroyed many things inside of us that prevent us from receiving this healing, right? God doesn't work that way. God doesn't change. He's not moody like we are, okay? God needs time, and we need to be honest with ourselves, okay? So God gave us these passions for a certain reason, okay? God gave us these passions for a holy purpose, okay? If he put anger inside of us, the emotion of anger, it's anger for what? Should be directed at the injustice of this world and the sin that is in me, okay? When the Lord uh, overthrew the temple, he was angry, correct? But he didn't sin. And the psalm says, be angry but do not sin, right? So God put these things inside of us for a certain reason, okay? Maybe there's a little bit of envy inside of us so that we can emulate the virtues of the saints, right? Right? And we have certain desires that we may thirst after God, not after the pleasures of this world. So our passions need to be consecrated. They need to be baptized. They need to be made holy, okay? As I said, the passions are not really eradicated, but they're transformed, okay? They are healed so that we can use them for a positive purpose. Now back to our concept of freedom that I spoke about in the beginning. To have true freedom is to have victory over sin, And my personal repentance begins when I fight against these passions. And for everyone, it's different, okay? I'm just, in this talk, I'm just trying to um, bring, spark some thoughts into your mind. Hey, what are my struggles? And let me assess and look at what are the roots of the problem. And over time, we need to replace the old with the new, okay? But it's a slow and steady process, as I said. And as... I become sanctified, okay, as I begin to get rid of these passions and I begin to implant them with virtues. I become enlightened, okay? There's a term called enlightenment that the church fathers use all the time, okay? There's many different levels of the spiritual life, okay? But many of us are in the elementary level, okay? We didn't overcome the simple things of this world to reach the very high levels that we see about and we hear about. But if I'm full of darkness and not full of light, how can I be a witness to Christ in this generation? If I'm just like everybody else in this world, how can I be a light? If Christ asks us to be a light to the world, I have to be enlightened. I have to be full of light, full of the Holy Spirit, and I can't be in darkness like the world is. All these passions, all these things of the soul simply bring darkness into our lives, okay? Darkness brings confusion. It brings frustration. It brings a lack of clarity. There's no guidance. I don't know where I'm going. I'm frustrated. I'm spinning my wheels. All these things because our souls and spirits have become darkened. Then and only then will we be, will we be true witnesses to Christ. Okay? As I said, this generation needs something different. Okay? People don't need sermons. You can get any sermon you want on the web. 
okay? People need to see changed lives, and they need to see us as Christians showing them how to overcome the struggles, how to overcome the desires. As one preacher said, we are scared of offending everyone in this politically correct age except for God. We're scared to offend everyone except for God. But I promise you, if we do these things, and if we overcome the evil inside of us, and we become truly enlightened persons, living in the spirit and not the flesh, we will witness to this world like no other. Okay? I know we don't believe that, but that's true. You know why? Because our spirit knows no bounds. Okay? And when we're living in the flesh, then we're constrained by the flesh. Okay? The flesh says that, hey, I can't change anybody's mind. right? But the spirit has no bounds. Let me give you an example. In the book of Acts, when Philip overtook the Ethiopian eunuch, how did he get there? The Spirit carried him, right? He was somewhere, many, many miles away, but the Spirit carried him, right? The Spirit knows no bounds. Philip didn't need to get on a train or get on something and go ride to him and take several days, but the Spirit is not bound, okay? We are not bound, but because we are living in the flesh, our spirits are constrained, okay? Someone like Pope Carlos VI, how does he know when someone comes to him what their problem is? How can he do that? How can he heal people? Because he was a man living in the spirit and not in the flesh. So I promise you, if you want to be a witness to Christ, and we're all asking the same question, right? What are we going to do in this evil generation? All the time, I'm fighting with myself saying, what am I going to do with my kids? My kids have to grow up now in this era where they're going to be seeing people who are one identity one day and another identity another, and the homosexual marriage and all these things. But I promise you, if we live our Christian lives the way we're supposed to, it would be the greatest witness ever. The only thing in this world that is absolutely free is God, okay? And unless you are united to him, you will be in bondage all the days of your life, okay? Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed, okay? In order for us to be free, we have to be united to the one that is free. We are born into bondage and slavery, Okay? And when you are baptized, you join the family, you become united to the Holy One who is able to set you free. Okay? But many of us, like the Israelites did, we want to go back to Egypt. Okay? And we're in the slavery of Egypt. Whatever form it takes, could be the love of pleasure, the love of money, the love of glory, whatever it is, but we each have to look at ourselves. How is it possible that the Lord said, greater things than these you will do? Greater things than the, we'll do greater things than Christ did? Is that possible? How? Has to be in the Spirit. I don't know how. To be honest, this verse is a mystery to me. I don't know how we do things greater than raising the dead and healing the sick and, and all the miracles. I have no idea. But God promised us that. We have to take that promise. So in light of all this, let's read the words of Pope Carlos VI again, and I'll conclude with this. How needful the human being is of service of the Spirit in an age where materialism, atheism, apostasy, and deviant intellectual trends prevail. How needful people are to see Christ in our lives and to smell his sweet fragrance in us. There is upon the church a critical duty at this juncture, this was in 1959, through which the world is passing today. It is upon her to advocate faith in the hearts, to spread virtue, that's the asceticism, out with the old, in with the new to bring peace and serenity into every weary soul so that tranquility might abound and well-being might be plentiful, okay? Now, hopefully, these words have a little deeper meaning, okay? And we can understand what it means that we are in need to live in the spirit in this evil age, and by that, we will bring peace and serenity to every weary soul. These are not my words. These are the words of a very enlightened holy man, okay, who knows 100 billion times better than me or than any one of us. Okay? So hopefully we can take that and we can begin right away. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait until the next day. But let's begin now. Okay? Let's see what it is that needs to go and what needs to come. Okay? But don't get rid of anything without replacing it with something else. If you're going to get rid of the TV, get rid of the TV, but replace it with something else. In other words, if, you're gonna, if you have to watch TV, watch something that's going to edify you, that's going to build you up. Listen to a sermon. If you're going to cut out the internet, Start reading things that are, you know, more beneficial to you, right? We don't have to stop everything, but we have to replace and we have to build, okay? And glory be to God forever, amen. Let's stand up for prayer.